From Los Angeles, it's Unmaking Movies, the only screenwriting podcast that goes there. With your host, Andrew Blumenthal. Now, let's start the show. Welcome to Unmaking Movies. I'm Andrew Blumenthal, and my guest today is writer-director Tom DiCillo, who's here with me to take a look back at his 1995 indie gem, Living in Oblivion. In this film, a ragtag film crew struggles to get that perfect shot despite the conspiracy of forces threatening to derail the work. Whether it's a boom mic dipping into frame, an actor forgetting her lines, or a light blowing out, Murphy's Law lurks riotously around every corner. All the while, the film within a film's high-strung director, Nick Rev, played to neurotic perfection by Steve Buscemi, does everything he can to keep the fragile production afloat. And then there's the diva antics of leading man Chad Palomino, played by James Legro, whose brazen, oh no, he didn't performance inspired many a rumor about a certain A-lister who he's been said to base his hilarious pomposity on. But despite the onset challenges, production delays, and personality clashes, Living in Oblivion highlights another poignant truth about filmmaking. When all the elements finally do line up, cinematic magic emerges. Exhibit A, Living in Oblivion. Tom DiCillo, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Andrew. It's great to be here. You know, this film has uh, established itself as a legend of indie film, almost because it's behind the scenes story. A lot of people know the origin story, but I'm going to ask you to recap how it started out as one thing, and it wasn't originally intended to be a feature. I mean, first of all, Andrew, I, I really appreciate your, uh, you know, your interest in this film. And uh, let's face it, you know, it's, uh, it, it's got a few years on it. I made it in 1995. And uh, the thing is amazing to me is still to this day, it feels like I just shot it two days ago. Uh, there's something about this experience that is, is so still alive in me. And, and all I can say is, is I lucked out. I lucked out. I, I, I got a film that, that, uh, that came alive, you know. So uh, how that happened, it actually came out of a really dark period in, in my cinematic career. I had, I had achieved a miracle to me, you know, and to many people by getting my first feature made and distributed by one of the biggest distributors in the United States, <laughs> Miramax. That film played in New York for about four days after five years of like raising the money and trying to get it made. And, and this was Johnny Swade, yes? Johnny Swade, starring Brad Pitt. And uh, I'll never forget the, the phone call that I got uh, at, at 12 o'clock on a Thursday night, right before the New York Times review came out. And it, it, it was an old reviewer. I'm nothing wrong with old reviewers, but this guy was like just... Dusty, dusty, dusty. Uh, and, and, and Harvey Weinstein read me the review over the phone. And, and uh, basically the guy said uh, about Johnny Sway, there's, there's something going on in this movie, but if anybody knows what it is, please tell me. And, and Harvey goes, uh, sorry, Tom, I'm really sorry. You, we know what this means. And I said, Harvey, what does it mean? What does it mean? You told me how much you like this movie. You bought the film. The film just disappeared. Uh, and it made... It really difficult to get my next film off the ground, which was supposed to be a film called Box of Moonlight. And mm-hmm. it was all set to go. The financing was in place. After Johnny Swade, it just got very shaky. And I lost all the finance for Box of Moonlight. And at that moment, uh, I went to a wedding. Out of the darkness, this guy comes up and he says, Tom, congratulations. I said, what for? You made a film, Johnny Sway, lights, camera, action. He was a guy from one of my acting classes, okay, that I had, I had been in. He was so excited for me. And I, in the mood I was in, Andrew, I'm, you know, sorry, I just looked at him and I said, shut the fuck up. You don't know the first thing about what it's like to make a movie. You could be on the set. You're finally there. You're all ready to go. It's a perfect shot. Everything's right. The actress is perfectly primed to do the shot. And the camera screws up. Cut! What the fuck is that sound? Not me. It's a camera. Fuck it is. It's off. It wasn't even running, dick glass. What is going on down there? Do I have a lockup? Nothing. You don't hear a beating sound? The street's quiet. 
the fuck is it? It's somebody's watch. Right at that instant, the idea hit me for living and oblivion. Because I began to like think about all the things, and in particular, what it would do to an actor, actress in this case, you know, to steadily be bombarded by these 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 incidents that would destroy the one thing you're trying to get on film. And I went home and I wrote the first half hour uh, uh, of the film in about two days. Catherine Keener was a friend. She was she was in Johnny Suede. And she happened to come in for a visit on the third day when I had just finished the script. And I said, hey, Catherine, you know, you want to you wanna read this? Uh, I will never forget the sound of her laughter. She was in another room, you know, other end of the house. And she has she, a great laugh. Oh, That's my God. God. She was howling, howling, yeah. howling. And she said to me, she, uh, this, she left the next day. She said, Tom, we have to make this movie. Dermot mm-hmm. Mulroney, who was with Catherine at the time, uh, uh, put up $5,000 instantly, mm-hmm. right? He said he'd like to play, you know, the director. And uh, I said, I really would like your money, Dermot, but um, I think actually you would be really excellent as Wolf, the camera. And to his enormous credit, he just said, okay, what about Steve Buscemi for the director? <laughs> and I knew Steve. I mean, I, I had known him for, for years. and. Uh, and uh, but would my would my mind have gone there instantly? I don't think so. Uh, mm-hmm. I, for some reason, I don't know why. Uh, uh, but it, but the, the moment Dermot said it, I went, absolutely, that's it. And uh, Steve read the script. He you know he said yes instantly, and and we raised seventeen thousand dollars and got the first half hour shot and edited and put into a film. You know, mm-hmm. on sixteen millimeter. And then there became the, the, this strange thing that I had never anticipated, which was, what was I going to do with it? It was a half an hour, literally. Mm-hmm. Too long for a festival. Festivals did not want it. And then I remember that on the last day of shooting, everybody was kind of standing around on set. Andrew, I, the sense of excitement and exhilaration and just complete joy from mm-hmm. everybody on the set was unprecedented for me. Uh, Usually a film said, no matter how great it's going, it's, it's just, it's got a constant kind of anxiety and, and tension. And it's hard to really enjoy yourself. Uh, and again, I was the most focused on this movie that I've ever, ever been in my life. So on the last day of shooting, on the, on the first half hour, which was a five-day shoot, everybody was standing around kind of depressed. And I said, what's up? And, 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 and Catherine came up and said, Tom, man, you gotta, we, we got to make a feature out of this. And I went... Oh, uh, well, uh, you know, this is the movie. This is the movie. Uh, and when I found that I couldn't get it into a festival and I, you know, and, and even distributors, uh, I went to, I went back to Miramax, believe it or not, after what they did to me. And I said, here, here's a, here's a half an hour of, of, of a film. You know, maybe I'm, I'm thinking of making a feature out of it. And their response was, don't do that, please. You know, this is not a movie. Forget it. Forget it. Suffice it to say, I, I followed an avenue towards some some sleazy guy who wanted to put up the money to turn it into a feature when I was going to sign this deal. In other words, basically reverse everything that I had done to get the film made. In other words, everybody worked for free, yep. total freedom, no producers, no nothing. Suddenly, I was going to have a producer telling me who to cast, and, and I just, I, but I didn't have any options at that point. And suddenly, my phone rang, and it was my wife's cousin. Who ended up getting a part in the film? Right, Hillary. Hillary, yeah. yes. And her husband plays Speedo, the sound guy. The, right. You know, the guy with the goatee. And and the guy who came up to me at the party and said, "Hey, Tom, you know, way to go for Johnny Swade." I made him the clapper. Uh, I gave him a part. So my phone rang. It was Hillary. She basically said, "Hey, Tom, you know, we were thinking, would you mind if we financed the film?" Mm. I said, "Hold on a second. Just hold on. I got." You got the guy who was on call waiting. I said, you know what, man? Uh, you can take your money and just stick it up, you know. And it just was so miraculous. She put up the rest of the money in, mm-hmm. in order for, for us to be able to shoot for 15 days. The cast was a mir- miraculously all together still. Uh, you know, Dermot, Steve, Catherine, um, 
Those were the key players, and they were all available. We should say that there was an eight-month gap between the first short film that you referenced that was 30 minutes. That yes. was filmed um, at one point in time, and then the financing of the subsequent two chapters came about eight months later. About eight months later, yes. And, you know, what, what I'm leaving out is how I went from the first half hour to uh, a 90-minute screenplay. And I began to, I, you know, conceive of it as a series of dreams. The first, the first half hour is in the film, frame for frame. That's exa- every the beginning frame and the end frame. That's exactly what's in the film. And and Bustemi's character Nick wakes up from a dream. He's having an anxiety trip. Anyway, I finished the script for part two. Then I was like totally freaking out, wondering what I was going to do with part three. And I will never forget it. My wife was watching me. And she just looked up from the table one because night. Because p- part two ended up being an anxiety dream of Catherine ah, Keener's character. Yes. So part one was like Nick's anxiety dream. Part two right. was right. the actress's anxiety dream. Yes. Right. And, and keep in mind that, that just due to my whatever my nature is, I didn't want the, the film to appear segmented. And, and right. like uh, it, I wanted it to have a unity. Like Even a through though, line, some kind yeah, of through line. Yeah. Exactly. So that whatever happened in part one actually carries into part two. Uh, here I was now faced with how do I wrap it up in the third act? My wife looked at me and she said, listen, you got part one is a dream. Part two mm-hmm. is a dream. Why don't you have part three be them shooting a dream sequence? Mm. It was a but, brilliant, brilliant idea. And it I, really is. And like it, it, it provokes a, a philosophical question about screenwriting for me. And that is, it did feel seamless. Um, uh, and it did feel like there was like a holistic arc. And it wasn't like three disjointed right. films cobbled together. So right. you think like if you have a good gem of an idea or a seed of an idea for a story, that sort of DNA can actually carry on to a larger I story at so. all times. Yeah. yeah. If, and, you know, if you, if, because sometimes, Andrew, I'm sure you know that, that, that accidents happen in writing uh, that, that you didn't expect. And, and, and so the, the, the trick is being able to go, oh, wow, suddenly uh, a little kernel of, of gold has appeared. And you go, I wasn't expecting that. It's yeah. too valuable. It's too valuable to throw it away. But you got to be able to see it and say, oh, now what can I do with that? There I was with this idea. Okay, make, make part three a dream sequence that they're shooting. And the first thing I thought of was there would need to be a small person in it because <laughs> it, it just it infuriated me that in every single dream sequence that you see, there's always a small person in it. <laughs> right. And I said, I'm going to address that. I'm going to address that. I'm going to have this, this guy, you know, suddenly look up and be pissed off and say, what the fuck? Why is this the only way you can make this a dream sequence? I, I, that idea had come to me very early of that I wanted to have that moment. Look, Tito, it's not that big of a deal. It's a dream. Strange things happen in a dream. All I want you to do is laugh. Why is that such a problem for you? Why does it have to be a dwarf? What? Why does my character have to be a dwarf? It doesn't have to be a dwarf. (laughs) Then why is he? Is that the only way you can make this a dream? Put a dwarf in it? No, Tito. Have you? ever had a dream with a dwarf in it? Do you know anyone who's had a dream with a dwarf in it? No! I don't even have dreams with dwarves in them. The only place I've seen dwarves in dreams is in stupid movies like this. It came together, man. I got it all done. And so now we go back and I have a, I have a feature script. I got the money and uh, we started shooting. Let me segue into a casting question because you mentioned the little person character and you ended up getting Peter Dinklage, who right. was hilarious. Like, oh. I don't know if you could have imagined the no. comedic angle he would bring. It's, it's actually interesting. I mean, I, I would just like to speak about that because it, 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 it illustrates something uh, about this whole process. Because a director, even when you cast, it's like you're writing. Even though you've written the part, when you cast the actor, you're further writing the part. Because that actor brings something that no other actor can bring to it. And it's actually a very intricate web of, of writing that that actor is doing. Okay. And so there yeah, I've written this part and I foolishly, foolishly thought that the casting director simply had to bring in 
uh, a few small people. <laughs> That's it. And then I realized, because this is, how, this is how, how, how stupid I was, that just because someone is small does not mean they're a good actor. I need to find a small person who is a really good actor, I realized. That's what I had written. And somebody said, you know what? It was Kevin Corrigan who plays the AC in the film. He said he knew this guy that worked in a, in a fax uh, office, you know, back in the times where no one had fax machines. You had to go to the corner and, and send a fax, if you right. want. And uh, he says, I, his name's Peter. I, I don't know how to get a hold of him. Finally, finally, I got a hold of this guy, Peter Dinklage. He, he had been to Bennington College in Vermont. He had a, a, a master's degree, a bachelor's degree, in, in acting. He came in and auditioned. And uh, I said to him, so Peter, you know, what, uh, what's one thing that, that would really irritate you right now? You know, I was trying to get him to reach a certain... As, as a small person. Yes. Mean, yes. Right. Yes. And he said, try patting me on the head. <laughs> suddenly I went, right, how many millions of people think that it's okay just to pat someone on the head just because they're a certain size? But what he brought to the part was such a gift to me. Uh, he's like Shakespeare. He's like a Shakespearean actor in this part. And it would not have worked without it if he had not been so serious. Does he have a weighty, surly personality in his actual persona? Oh, um, or is, okay, because I feel like he almost <laughs> was Tito. A little bit. Or, that's yes. what I wanted to find out. Yes, a little bit. Yes, but 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 still, an incredibly giving and gracious actor, and and, and was had was just so giving to me uh, uh, throughout. But it's uh, not just uh, Peter Dinklage because I have a whole question about casting, and that is you, you mentioned your cousin or your wife's cousin Hillary yeah. who put in some money, <clears throat> and then she was given a role as script supervisor character, yeah. and. Um, Danielle von Zernick put in some money and she got a role too. And you, you might think that like, you'd be compromising, especially to get a non-actor. But let me tell you something, the, the alchemy. No, I, I, there, I, I think You're absolutely right. right. You're absolutely like, right. It, it could have gone the other way, Andrew. It could have totally gone the other way. When you think of like perfectly cast productions, like I think of Seinfeld, I think of like right. Joe Pesci and Marissa Tomei yeah. and my cousin Vinny or, or Angelica Houston and Raul Julia and the Adams Family. Like these are right. lightning in a bottle casting decisions. And, and you said before that, like usually it's a very slow and deliberate months long process where you're involving callbacks and casting directors. But these people just kind of circumstantially came into the production and they were like no perfect. So like, how can you kind of explain that miraculous <sighs> luck? That's exactly what it was. But I, I, I perhaps, perhaps I can attribute it to a little bit of my intuition and in knowing because I knew Dermot, I knew Catherine, right? Danielle, I had never worked with. Uh, she had come in and audition for me, uh, for Johnny Swade, so I knew her a little bit from that. But Peter, definitely not. And and James LeGrow, definitely not. That's a story that I want to share with you because because you're absolutely right, Andrew. Uh, so much goes into casting that you want to make sure before you get on the set that the person is the exact right person for the role, you know, because you don't want to be in the middle of the production starts, you know, uh, $500,000 is, is being spent and, and suddenly you realize the actor is not right. Uh, you could potentially sink the whole ship. Oh my God. Well, yeah. no one, and with the exception of Peter Dinklage, auditioned uh, mm -hmm. for Living in Oblivion. I've made very deliberate casting decisions on some of my other movies that didn't turn out so great. It was fortune. It was, it was, it, it just was, I think perhaps also me going, you know what? I'm going to take a little bit of the of the weightiness off of this and just let people have fun uh, and not really worry so much that every note of the performance has to has to fulfill the script. Right? And, and so I was a little more relaxed, perhaps, you know, uh, mm. I mean, the, the biggest kick was 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 James LeGrow originally. And I think I might know where you were going with that with that rumor. Uh, it had to be addressed. And I yeah, knew you addressed yeah. it before. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you did because it is a rumor, and I, I had a chance to squash it uh, when the film went to Sundance. Well, let me just let me let's let's just say what the rumor is. Okay, here's the okay. rumor. Here's the rumor. The rumor is James LeGrow is drawing upon uh, Brad Pitt for for the inspiration of his character, and who is a fucking nightmare on set. His yeah. character is the most pompous. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. you know. Yes, right. I have a thought. What if Damien? Had an eye patch like Wolf. Mm. 
you think about that one, Chad? All right, you're the genius. Nick Brown, living in oblivion. Scene six, take one, let's turn it! He's arrogant, he's completely ungiving to the other actors. All he cares about is himself and, and you know, does, won't even do the most basic thing that the director asks. So let's go back a little bit before James LeGrove came into the picture. Mm -hmm. I had a great experience working with Brad on Johnny Sway. So the first thing I did when I finished the script for Living in Oblivion was I sent it to Brad. And he said, absolutely. He wanted to play Chad Palomino. He was, he was signed up to play the part. So Brad was all set to do it. And uh, he got a, a schedule conflict due to Legends of the Fall. He had a, all this press he had to do for the film. And so we had to pull out. And I'm on the phone with Catherine. Catherine was, was in her house in, uh, in Los Angeles. I was in New York. And suddenly she goes, hold on a second. She put the phone down and, and she yelled out the window. She said, hey, James, you want to be in a movie? It was James Legro. James Legro walking past her window on the street. <laughs> That's how James Legro was cast. Now, he had just come off of Point Break with Patrick Swayze. That's why his hair was like that. Right. Okay. okay. So he based his entire character, this looking in the in the, the reflection of the lens and, and fixing his hair and doing all this, total Patrick Swayze. It had nothing to do with Brad Pitt. It does a discredit to both people. Right. First, right, right. it does a discredit to Brad because it's simply not true. And it was hurtful to him. Secondly, it does a discredit to James LeGrow and what he created as a character. Do you know where that's that rumor? you know, the got started, who started it, and I why no it idea. had such legs over the years? I had no idea. The film got accepted into the Sundance Film Festival in 1995. Uh, Catherine got there first, right. uh, a day earlier than I did. She called me in New York and said, Tom, people are starting to say that that uh, that this character, James LeGros character, is based on Brad. I cracked up. I said, that's ridiculous. Yeah. I, you know, so I didn't say anything about it. And so I, I thought it was so ludicrous. I, I didn't even take it seriously. And that's when it took off. Now, things that's happen like in uh, The Revenant, there's, you know, the rumor that Leonardo DiCaprio's character got raped by the grizzly bear. And mm -hmm. the writer and director, they were dogged with that. People kept asking them. And eventually it became funny to them. But right. it's just perplexing how, like, someone floats an idea, someone overhears it, and then it yeah. becomes kind of embedded. Yeah, okay, let me ask you, what did Brad Pitt think of the performance that James LeGrow did and what and was he, he um, has Brad, he come to terms with this rumor that's been Brad and Brad and was was with Gwyneth at the time and so oh. they came to the to the LA premiere of the film he was cracking up and and uh, I actually went to uh, I spent the afternoon with him because I wanted to address it and uh, it was very strange Andrew I felt yeah. I felt really bad because he I could tell that he did not trust me. And uh, he didn't believe me. And it was very awkward. And I could tell his feelings were really hurt. And uh, uh, he thought that I had indeed, you know, made fun of him. And uh, it, it's, I mean, you know, to this day, I, I haven't spoken to him. Uh, I've sent a number of letters. I've spoken in the press about it every chance I can. Uh, and acknowledge my own uh, responsibility for not killing it as, as soon as it, it came out. But... I mean, I was a novice myself. I didn't know anything about press and publicity. Yeah. I didn't know that stuff. Uh, but if anything, I, I, I was troubled by that. All right, let me let me try to intervene. Hey, Brad Pitt, let it go. Tom had nothing to do with it. It's bullshit. I've heard interviews with him in the past trying to negate this rumor. It wasn't him. So there, how's, how's that? Did I do there some spiritual healing? All right, I want to shift to a, a directing question. And this is very kind of nuanced. And it's almost difficult to explain the question, but I will do my very best. So in the first segment of the film, <clears throat> where the two main actors are trying to film this simple, unbroken shot, everything goes wrong, one thing after another, where the director has to yell, cut. This is the movie within a movie. Catherine Keener, in playing Ellen, she has to become sort of increasingly frustrated as these botched takes keep piling on. And even though her character is supposed to be getting a little unnerved, she's still very, very good. Was that a directing challenge to direct the actor within a movie to have varying levels of upset um, okay. as she's marching towards the conclusion where everything goes to hell? But, you know, how did you calibrate her performance 
um, to get it exactly as you want. And you have to do multiple takes of each take within a take, if you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, so it's a really good question, actually, because uh, there needs to be, if in order for the, the arc of the drama to work, there needs to be a rise, and it needs to be categorical. In other words, each one leads to another level of tension, which will lead to actually her freaking out, which is what we wanted to have happen. Um, and uh, we made like this little chart, Catherine and I, there was like, I think seven takes. And we said, okay, and we, and we, had, we had this little chart, take one, take, you know, and, and we said, okay, and this one, you want to be like at around a one or three here, you want to be four. And, and we had that. And uh, you know what? It ended up that it was just the reality of what happened in each take that it had its own natural progression. And I didn't have to do too much, uh, uh, particularly with someone like Catherine, who's, who's uh, just imagination and, and spontaneity. I mean, she, it's almost impossible for her to do the same thing twice, which is actually a great, great thing to say for an actor. Yeah. And I also think with Catherine, like, I feel like she's hyper intelligent in real life where her mind is working faster yes. than yes. many other people in the room. Yes. So she can, right. like, play ball, you know? Yes, exactly. And she can also you know, immediately not feel like she's intellectualizing anything, that she's she's like a live wire. It's one of the reasons why I cast her in in uh, in Johnny Swade in because because of that quality that that uh, you know you never knew what she was gonna do next. In some ways it was a little terrifying uh, to a director because you know, you know, you know, you know, you need a certain continuity to get through a shoot, but you also, more important than that, is you need life. Because film acting, you have to believe that it's happening for the first time. Right. Have to. Yeah. When you're in the theater and you're watching a stage performance, I believe that there is always a part of the, of the human brain in the audience that's thinking it's live. You know, it may be still a terrible canned performance, but the actor could have a heart attack and die in about three seconds or whatever. Sure. Yeah. So there, so there is a, there's, there's an a, urgency to it. And there's a strange liveness to it. Yeah. With, with film, the, the, the shot has been done months and months and months earlier. And so you, the, the, the in, intention is to try to capture something uh, that, that's never happened before. And so even when she, she gets angry, there's still a, a kind of creative delight in the way she does it. And yeah. so, you know, especially with that character, uh, you know, you want to fall in love with her. And so that when, when Nick, Steve Buscemi's character says, you know, you know, I've, I've been in love with you since the day we met. You know, it's it's like it's like a it's almost like a, a romantic love story from the '40s or '50s. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, yeah. Or Carol Lombard or something like that. You know, but that's a good question. I did I did have you know some anxiety about how to how to do that, and ultimately it was just kind of making sure that every take captured something that that I thought was was vital, and and ended up when we put it together in the editing. It had its own build. Yeah, but actors who know what they're doing, they 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 get it. They have the intuition. You know, you don't have to like strain to get exactly what you want. They're, right. they're kind of like partners in crime, right. which is you know why kind of casting is is so vital. It's but, true. Um, yeah, it's very true. And at, at times, I have felt practically useless on the set <laughs> in the face of a really great actor. You know how you had non-actors. Um, who were just, they, they were able, they, they were indistinguishable from the seasoned actors. I don't know if like, do you think that acting can be taught or if it's just an innate ability, whether or not someone takes that path of their lives and becomes an actor or not, can you put someone in front of a camera and they're either going to have that ability to embody a character or they're just never going to be able to, or I it can be taught? I, it's, it can be taught. I think there has to be uh Let's see. I think if you look at it, mo most of like the really great actors never went to school. Uh, if they did, I mean, I don't think Cary Grant ever studied film acting. I mean, he may have gone to theater. Mm -hmm. He might, you know, but Humphrey Bogart, I don't think studied acting. Uh, it's it's a matter of creating a space where whoever is there can can uh, can can just be themselves and enjoy. Uh, you know, if they can fight the nervousness and the anxiety of being in front of the camera and just be themselves, well, that is a huge step towards giving a great performance on screen. But but you can 
with a non-actor get something spontaneous uh, if they're if if they have it in them, a natural sort of instinct to just simply uh, relax in front of the camera. You can do did, it. Did you have any special technique for dealing with the non-actors because they might have been more scared than someone who's had onset experience? My first experience actually acting myself was a massive uh, revelation to me. And uh, I had been in an acting class as a director, just as an observer. And a guy in that class, uh, who happened to be this guy named Chris Noth, you know the actor Chris Noth? Mr. Big? Yes. Sure. Uh, and so he was in the class with me, and uh, I didn't know him. He tapped me on the shoulder, he says, hey man, you wanna do a scene? I said, I'm, I'm not an actor, I'm, I'm, I'm just here to watch it, I'm, I'm a director. He says, come on, let's do a scene. So <laughs> me and Chris Noth got up in front of the class about a week later and did a scene from David Mamet's Sexual Perversity in Chicago. The second I was on that screen, that, that, that stage, looking at him, it affected forever the way I talk to an actor because the sense of vulnerability, the sense of, oh my God, this is, this is a very frightening place because you, you're going to have to like try to find something real while everybody's watching this. And, and how that then began to manifest itself on the set of my films was I said, I will always, always, first thing is make sure the actor feels comfortable in the environment. Oh, Paul, I'm really sorry about all this. Oh, this, no, you know. no, no, it's not your fault, Nick, no. Um, listen, I was wondering, uh, is there any way maybe to use some of those earlier takes? Not unless I change the shot and do a cutaway of Cora and then find a way to intercut the takes, but I don't want to do that, all right? This is no. a really nice shot, and what you're doing is incredible. Really? Really incredible. Okay. All right? Yeah. Look, once we get the radio mics on, it's going to go a lot smoother. Okay? So you just, yeah. you know, whatever. Take take a moment. Let all this shit go. Do whatever you, you know. All right. We're not going to roll till you're ready. Okay? Yeah, thanks. Right. Okay. okay. And they know that I'm watching what they're doing. If sure. there's anything that an actor fears the most and throws them off the most is when they feel the director is not seeing anything they're doing. Because then you're going, uh, why should I give him anything? Uh, yeah. that, that's that, that's what I would say. It's like you know, I I I don't I never yell at an actor. Uh, I my my technique is that is that I I always like to in order to help create the sense of surprise is whisper an idea to an actor right before a take mm. and not give them a note and not tell the other actor. Yeah, this was actually even addressed in the film, um, the film within a film where um, Wolf the DP. He says he's going to need to do a couple of run-throughs to get the dolly movements right. And right. and Nick says, you know, not too much. I don't want to wear the actors out. Because, you know, when someone's acting out some kind of traumatic moment, it's the same level of intensity that they would experience if they were really going through the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, like, I remember uh, I was an AD on a film, and there was a crying scene where um, the actress had to break out in tears. And... After each take, the director walked up and said, are you OK? Are you good to go again? You know, if he was just like being very thoughtful. And um, so I, I thought that was interesting how, like in the film, Nick said, I, I, I don't want to overstrain them until we're until we're, you know, rolling. Um, which, that was which, well, well noted, you know. Which brings us to, I think, one of the core elements of the of, the, of my interest in this film. Uh, uh, which is the fact that it's so fragile. The, the, the element of, of, of chaos and what, yes, 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 every film is chaotic. But what I'm saying is, is when you stumble upon a really beautiful moment, it, it is so fragile and, and uh, it, it can be squashed in a second. Uh, and, and that can be terrifying. And, and, and all you, because, Literally, someone can cough. Someone can be having an argument with someone uh, that's been building for five days, and suddenly it, it comes out right when the actress is about ready to do a scene, or or tensions between crew members, or whatever. It's so fragile, which what you know. Uh, and I wanted to try to show that 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 uh, and, you know, it is miraculous. I do believe it is miraculous when you capture something alive and 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 beautiful on film
Excellent. All right. Well, I'm going to ask a question that I know you haven't been asked before, and this involves a bit of fantasy. What would happen to the movie within a movie, which was also called Living in Oblivion? Was that a good movie? Would it have been podcasted about 25 years after its release? Would it have had a festival run? I'm going to let you, I'm going to let that. And obviously there's no wrong answer here. However, you were the most well-sourced person for me to ask that as the, the creator of the movie and the movie within a movie. Take it away, Tom DeCillo. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I I must confess that as the writer of the of the movie within the movie, um, I cut myself a, a few breaks in order to to uh, have the scenes that they were filming fulfill what I wanted to say, what I what I wanted to address as a filmmaker. So it enabled me to go in and out of this movie that Nick Rev had written and directed, and and. And uh, you know, so it sort of implied a continuity, a uh, a narrative, <laughs> you know. And um, I would have to say that, listen, I I don't I don't know what the rest of that movie is, <laughs> <laughs> but I do know this: I know that the scenes in the film that Nick Rev, Steve Buscemi directed, were good scenes. You know, actually, ah, this is good because <laughs> that's a really good question. Andy. Watch this. Let's go from the beginning. The scene in, in part one that they're trying to get never gets realized. It's a dream concept. It's As in, it's a concept of someone's dream. In, in Nick's head. The scene that he wants on the couch with the two women never happens. He never gets it on film because, you know, Wolf is in the bathroom puking his guts out. Right. <laughs> so it, it would never appear in Nick's movie because he never got it. Uh, they might have gotten an, an inferior version of it. Yes. Someday, they, they, yeah. They got all those bad takes of Catherine with the mic coming in the shot and, and her losing her focus and the, the light exploding. Because uh, holy shit, when they're doing their rehearsal. And she really yes. sinks into it. It's like next level, moving, touching, yes. you know. But okay, <laughs> so I, I, your point is well taken. That that but moment, also, also the scene, the scene in the, the climactic scene in in part two, where you know Chad and 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 Ellen confess their love for each other. It's <laughs> the best part of the scene is when they have a fight. <laughs> right. Uh, so I, you know what. I include myself in this, Andrew. This is why this is a great question. Is that, is that, you know, I'm guilty of every, just like anybody else of being so infatuated and so, you know, deeply engrossed in my own work that that, that I don't. I, sometimes I lose perspective on whether it's any good or not. You know, and, and I can get a little self indulgent and and uh, you know. So so Nick is, is really like any director. The director is most of the time a neurotic chaotic mess most of the time okay and that's okay it's okay uh i, I did not want to have this director be a guy uh, or a woman uh uh sitting there uh just cool and smoke you know the indie director bullshit which is total horseshit i didn't want that i wanted this guy to to have the vulnerabilities and the and the foolishness that we all have as human beings, which goes back to answering your question about his movie. You know what? It's his first, let's call it his first feature. And uh, who knows what happened to it? But uh, maybe he learned some things on, on, the, on the set of Living in Oblivion. And That's a, a finer response as you could have possibly given. So, all right. All right thank Andy. you very much for all your well thought out answers. Well, thank you. I uh, like I said, this movie is still alive within me. You know, I I, I wish to make many more, but this one uh, was a magical con. What is it? Confluence, confluence of of things coming together in a way that you just go, okay, it's out of your control. It just happened. So, well, Andrew, great to talk. Making is forever. All right, thank you very much. I'm Andrew Blumenthal, and this is making movies. Bye.